So welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your lunch and I have the honor of uh, guiding through you through your food coma, which is upcoming. Uh, so let me just get you a few details on where are we with our tea, what's the state of the union. So currently we are uh, looking into uh, Linux 4.6 RT and 4.8 RT. Actually, that's going to change because we are going to soon drop 4.8 and go to 4.9 uh, because 4.9, that's what's going to be the next long-term stable. And uh, we don't, uh, so that's, that, that means that we just carry on 4.8 for a while until 4.9 goes into something usable state, which is usually around RC4, RC5, so that's four to five weeks out now. And then we just drop 4.8 support and just tell people don't use it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll come to that in a, minute, in a second. So 4.6. It's considered stable. Uh, we have no serious outstanding issues, but it's end of life. Because we, we just uh, support the, the versions up to the point where the stable maintainers stop working on it. Um, so food at four is, I think, the <coughs> most recent uh, LTS supported kernel, which still is uh, updated by us. And uh, so 4.9 will be the next one. Unless uh, something turns up in the merge window or during the stabilization phase that Brack decides not to go for it. If it's falling apart in bits and pieces, he might go for 4.10 or 4.8, we don't know. But it's, as things look like, shouldn't be that hard. Um, so 4.8, we have the first releases published. That's not, nothing serious. And as I said, we will abandon it for, in favor of 4.9. Um, let's a little bit talk about our upstream activities. So uh, in the last nine months, we have merged almost 300 patches from that work into the main line. We've fixed eight real and roughly 40 latent bugs. Interesting stuff which falls apart if you actually make the CPU hot plug stuff uh, be testable, which we hadn't had uh, for 16, 17 years or whatever when the uh, CPU hot plug started. So it was basically untestable, but the bugs are there. And they just are not discovered because uh, um, the whole, most of the time, CPU hot plug is used, go up, go down, be done with it. That, that whole combination works pretty well, but if you have something on the halfway up, halfway down, uh, failing, and then you have to revert the whole thing to the previous state, that's where things really f fall apart, and those error cases are not handled very well. Um, there were in other interesting things we, we discovered, like uh, ordering by chance. So that means the notifiers are just in the right order because the link time order of the init calls is by chance in the right order. So we tripped over that when we just moved one of the notifiers over to the state machine and then the ordering reverted and things died horribly. So now with the explicit state machine, we, we have a documented ordering. And so things should be more stable. Um, so let's look at what impact that has on RT. So going back to the beginning of the year, so that's 4.4 .4 RT with 350 patches and uh, you see the net uh, number of files changed and the insertions and deletions. So 
what we achieved by now, it's not much. We're touching 34 files less. That's roughly 10%. Uh, we have a slight increase in, line, in, in the number of lines we add, and the bulk of that is in drivers. So um, that's actually uh, not surprising, because uh, if you look at the speed, drivers flood into the kernel. Uh, so there's not, not a big surprise that you have to do some fix up left and right because drivers or most most of them are just crap. They kind of work, but uh, when you expose them to a little bit more sophisticated testing, then uh, they just fall apart. Some of that stuff is actually just working because lots of lots of these things are protected by other means on, in mainline, but not guaranteed. So that the the chance that it triggered the problem in mainline is relatively small. But RT makes just the, the windows more open, and so you get the damage. We're fixing that stuff upstream, but some of the things are just not fixable fast. So we have to carry workarounds in in RT around which is not fun, but yeah. So, uh, so you might ask, well, you, you sent 300 patches upstream, and you, we, you didn't cut the patch size in half. Yeah, why? Because what we are mostly doing right now is preparatory work. So we are trying to fix problems we've seen for years and try to address them in the right way. So, and that's mostly cleaning up upstream code, rewriting upstream code. CPU hot block, we got the timer wheel rewrite um, merged, which was another problem space in RT that we had to turn off the full, the no hurt stuff and um, the full no hurt support because they, uh, we were not able to to, to handle uh, the ti our timer wheel related issues in that context uh, on RT. Um, so that's fixed by now. We're still continuing a lot of preparatory work. And I think so that's my expectation that by end of next year, uh, we will finally start to, to, to start the end game, which means by end of 2018, we might get the, the switch, the config switch into the kernel bit. There's so much unknown territory ahead, so I can't predict that very well. My crystal ball is not working proper at the moment. So that's roughly what we can tell. Questions? No questions. That's good. We all have a coffee break. Uh, no. So uh, nothing I can tell you. I'm surprised. Uh, can you tell us how many uh, of the code uh, is in the strategy? How, how much uh, is going to, to get integrated into the main line of the kernel with all these things of the real time parts? Or is it still going to be a patch that stays outside the kernel for forever? Forever. <laughs> um, so the question was whether there will be, in the very end, uh, leftovers of the real-time patch, which will just stay out of the kernel forever. Um, so there's some stuff which might fall into the category, but we try to avoid that. So we were discussing yesterday about one of the, 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 the more debugging or, or tracing debugging oriented features and so if we do it right and if people think hard enough about it we can actually may argue it that you can it's beneficial for non real time use cases as well so it's just some more engineering work to come up with generic use cases for that and not focus in the implementation totally on the real-time needs. That's what we do a lot of times. I mean, that was, basically it was the way how I got uh, the high-resolution timers into the kernel. 
Um, Linus wanted to have the no hertz uh, idle stuff for because the power uh, management people were complaining about the tick ticking away for nothing. And so, but that needed a lot of other changes, and which we did. And then I told him, okay, you get a no hertz stuff for free, but you have to take HR timers because no hertz stuff depends on HR timers, which was not true, but or only, yeah, it was kind of true, uh, but he, he accepted that. And um, he said uh, that real-time people are pretty good in creating those nice Trojan horses, where he has this warm and fuzzy feeling that he gets really something what he wants and what he likes to see in the mainline kernel. And on the way there, we just get our other stuff he doesn't care about in. So, no, I'm not expecting that there's too much stuff going to be out of tree. Um, what we might end up, but I think it's then uh, going more into a, into a regular development uh, um, model uh, like any other uh, subsystem that we uh, then, at the very end, we have a lot of functionality which is basically now turned off when you enable RT because we just do not have the capacity to fix all that. So, but once it's in, so that might be some development work still going on or it's expected to, to happen. Uh, uh, when people come up and say, okay, we want to have this feature re-enabled when it's uh, when running RT, then this might still be an extra uh, for evaluation and testing purposes, but then it's going to, go to be fed through the proper subsystems and be done. So we're expecting it to normalize into normal kernel development style, which we can't do right now. Does that answer your question? Okay, more questions. Go ahead, ask questions, otherwise I start asking questions. <laughs> that could be embarrassing. I don't tell for well, for whom, but you can guess that. Yeah, I know. I uh, actually said I will take that. <laughs> yeah, there's another question. So he he. How the how much the engagement is, is happening with the real time Linux? You know, do you see more companies engaging with the idea and uh, using the real time patch, or is something that is is something that is nice to hear? But RT has a huge user base. But it's still the same, the same old thing. We use it, and it works. Works for us. And most people do not have issues with it. So the, the, uh, we don't see a massive uh, uptake in people actively contributing. No. We get the occasional bug reports and the occasional patch here. It explodes in that driver. Here's the fix or you got that wrong, but no, it's not, not really something where we see a lot of uh, uptake. Um, I didn't expect it, to be honest. I mean, industry just uses it, yes. And I know that the, the, the user space is steadily growing. Not necessarily because RT is so great. It's uh, also due to the fact that other operating system are even worse, <laughs> or not longer existing, or not supporting enough hardware, or whatever. Yeah, that's so. so it's and of course uh, uh, another reason is that uh, companies want to want to consolidate on their operating space, uh, system space, and if they use Linux for a lot of non-real-time stuff then using Linux for the real-time stuff as well it m makes a lot of sense from a, a maintenance point of view and, and uh, tooling and whatever. So, yeah, but no, it's great. It's the best real-time operating system out there. So, more questions?
there must be more, be more than one person in the room who has questions. Michael, you're hiding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know you have, always have questions. I mean, uh, yes and no. Um, so I said that uh, earlier uh, in, in earlier talks uh, that certainly when it comes to the end game, as long as we are doing just preparatory work and cleaning up the tree, nobody's going to object. They are all happy that some a masochist is going and rewrite hot block and fix up the timer wheel after 20 years. It's not being, it hasn't been changed in 20 years. Neither has hot block in 17 years. So and, uh, you really have to be some kind of, uh, un, you, there's a character thing you need to do that. Uh, so it hurts. Um, Yes, when, once we go further down the road where the real um, intrusive changes start, then I might get that question asked. And Linus said it to me a couple of times. He wants to see a strong user base supporting it. So it's not, not so much the, uh, he's not so much concerned about the, the, the 50 people working on it. Uh, I mean, he, he needs to get the feeling that there are enough users to sustain it and there's enough industry interest to actually keep the people around who can sustain it in terms of working on it. Yeah. I mean, uh, ideally, he sees, oh, there's 20 people from random companies working on it. But he's, he's good with, uh, okay, there's 20 companies supporting the five people who actually understand what they are doing. Yeah. So it works both ways. Yeah. yeah. Well, is that the case then? Is, um, is the industry interest more many small companies than large companies? Or if you had to put numbers on it? Uh, I mean, the, the support, the interest in, the interest in using, yeah. It's all over the place. Oh. It's from big corporate to the real small ones. So that's totally, I can't put numbers on that. But from what I see and what I know and what I hear, it's all over the place. So there's no, no preference on, on something. But I mean, of course, uh, at the moment, more the big, the big parties are investing in the, into that effort, yeah, which is not a surprise. Okay, so I guess my time slot <coughs> is still going, so more questions. Fun? Yeah, okay. So you can talk slower if you talk early. <laughs> You promise? I'll talk slower. Yeah. <laughs> Question. Yeah. You mentioned uh, yesterday that you know discussing with silicon vendors about uh, how they design their processors. Do you see, do you see anything, or do you, are you uh, aware of any desire for uh, for chip designs to actually be more amenable to RT use cases in terms of caching and things like that? No. No, I mean they are talking about it. So of course because they have interest to support all those interesting use cases. And there are definitely very interesting use cases coming up in the near future. One of the biggest one is going to be autonomous driving. I mean I think it's horrible but that's a, that's a different, different issue. So uh, of course they are trying to, to get into those markets but they don't want to go 
and change their designs radically. So some stuff we are seeing which will help, what uh, Jan and, and uh, Rick mentioned is the cash partitioning stuff Intel is doing, that's definitely a, a step into the right direction. But at the same time, they are still increasing the, the, the inherent uh, non-deterministic behavior of hardware, just because that's the only way how they can do performance improvements without wasting power. And so I expect that this stuff is going to dominate uh, our problem space for quite the next years. There might be um, things where, where uh, specialized uh, silicon vendors uh, like the FPGA folks or whoever uh, have a little or a little bit more interested in, in uh, uh, having de more deterministic behavior uh, from the hardware side but even there uh, they are bound to deliver the performance and the performance is going to involve caching parallel pipelines and memory orbiters and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I am... I think is going to happen in the long run, that um, you... The f the, the harder the your uh, real-time requirements get, the more you walk, go into the space of either uh, offloading the real tight stuff into an FPGA or into a tiny little microcontroller and then relax the requirements on the, on the main CPU. I mean, we see that, that kind of tendency in other places as well because they don't know what to do with the silicon right now. So they start to do accelerators, specialized accelerators. And if you look at it, if you just, um, just pick a random example, mo motion control, motor control, current control loops. So it's what, something you can easily do either in a microcontroller or in, a, in, in an FPGA. But that get, so, so the, the, the current control loop runs with typically 100 kilohertz or 125. Uh, so but the, the outer control loop, which feeds into the current control loop, uh, runs at a kilohertz or two kilohertz. So you're really um, um, taking the pressure away from the, from the main CPU. And I think that's where stuff is going to head because of the nature that the general purpose CPUs are going to be less deterministic over time. So just people have to understand that and not say, oh, well, well, but we could, we were able to do all that stuff on the good old uh, 386 with the parallel port and we're perfectly fine, yes. Good luck finding a 386 with a parallel port. Yeah, yeah, I mean, today's microcontrollers are as powerful as the 386 back then and so, but then they say, oh, but we need this extra piece of hardware. Yes, uh, I mean, you have to die of death. You can die because your control loops fall apart, or you can die of a heart attack because you have to spend the extra five cent on the PCB. And uh, funny enough, it's, I mean, I have this discussion on a regular basis. Then you're talking to those people and say, I say okay, what kind, yeah, there's a trade-off between making it work somehow on whatever random PC hardware uh, and actually spending the extra dollar because uh, if you're saving that extra dollar you have to clearly look at what quantities are you talking about. So if your total quantities per year are 10,000 so and your shipment duration is five years, so you spare, uh, so you, uh, spare 50,000 bucks. So now guess how much engineering time you get for 50,000 bucks. Definitely not enough to solve the problem. 
So it might be way cheaper to actually spend the extra dollar on this particular controller and uh, uh, reduce the engineering complexity. So that's, I think, where stuff is heading. I don't know. What's your experience? I mean, you're, you're in that um, extra, extra tight yeah. latency domain. Yeah. I mean, we have FPGAs, so yeah, when, we, we have a good answer for when our users want to go to, you know. The extra mile. Yeah, yeah. So you basically tell them, put it into the FPGA and be done with it. Offloading it into hardware. Yeah. yeah, that's what I expect to happen. But I don't see that the hardware, the hardware manufacturers are going to, to do it the other way around. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, question. Uh, would it be possible to, to do something? I mean, I don't know. Where's the other mic? Thank you. Um, I was wondering, is it possible, uh, ac academic discussion, somehow in a real-time uh, domain, would it be possible in the kernel to have a scheduler where actually build some statistical statistics and um, be able to hit next um, time and reduce the delay? For example, you have a, a, a loop you keep checking for to every 200 kilo, every two kilohertz, for example. This is a loop. So, and you have base timers that are accurate also. We possibly have somehow the system to accurate statistics and say, okay, I'm using this, I have this kind of behavior, I can do the maintenance a little bit at this time or that time, and make sure that I have available time for that task around with this jitter. I'm that's saying. what uh, that uh, uh, SCAT deadline is for. You have a scheduler where you can ex explicitly say I'm running at this time for that budget and the scheduler will move this, the rest of the crap out of the way. Okay. Because making these heuristics is going to be interesting. How many tasks are you going to monitor to do that? One? Uh, yeah. I don't know, I haven't thought, but this is a, an idea of... Uh, yeah, I know. I did, this came up before. Okay. So the, the question is, how many tasks are, are you going to monitor? One? It might work for one, but when you go, go and start to do behavioral monitoring on two or more or five, and then try to fit them all, it's going to be fun. It's not going to work. So explicit reservation-based scheduling, what the sched deadline does, is the, the answer to that question. Make sure that you get the free room there. Once the problems are solved. Yeah. What? Details. Details. <laughs> okay, one question. So I ask a question, who is actually willing to help us with that stuff? Or has spare cycles? Huh? Yeah. Um, no, seriously, we can we can we need help. Um, so a lot of the things you don't have to have the deep knowledge, the deep inside knowledge of RT in the first place. Some of the things is helping us to do the documentation, which is, uh, as always in open source projects, projects uh, not as good as it could be. We're not as good reaches from, oh, it's uh, not existing at all, to outdated, to, oh, yes, it's good. Um, that's something we really can uh, want to want to seek help actively. Uh, we have uh, a task to uh, move pages from the old RT wiki on the kernel org website to the new one on the Linux Foundation project website. We have it restructured, and we are trying to make it really useful instead of a 
dump place of random information, which is uh, some of which is outdated or false or whatever. Um, the other thing where we really need uh, people to to help them uh, is testing. So because we just have not the variety of neither the variety of hardware you have as a whole, and nor do we have the variety of use cases. So we can't just have our set of defined um, test cases, artificial test cases, and say, OK, it doesn't explode for us, so it must be perfect, uh, which is the approach every project uh, of this size is taking, because there's no way you can exercise all the combinations the Linux kernel has. So it's up to the users to actually go there and, and stress test that out with their particular piece of hardware, with their particular drivers and their application. That's what we need in the first place. If there are people who have spare cycles and want to help on the actual product, project coding, please contact us um, so we can coordinate and avoid uh, either embarrassment by um, I'm reviewing the stuff you're sending me from my patch set and I ask stupid questions and you can answer them or um, just avoiding uh, parallel work and uh, wasting cyclists for nothing. So that means I'm handing over to the next maintainer of this.